All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Genesis study. And we are now in um, Genesis chapter 46. And uh, it's amazing, as we were talking earlier today, you know, how far we've come. You know, we've, we've seen creation. We've seen, you know, Adam and Eve. We've seen the first sin. We saw the flood. You know, we saw the entrance of Abraham and his sons. And now we're winding down and we're seeing the tribes <laughs> go into Egypt and begin the journey for what we see as the way that we are to follow as we go into the Exodus. So I don't want us to forget all of the things that we see all the things that we've learned and all the things that we are to partake in for our lives as we get to chapter 46, you know, and how amazing it is to watch this family become the nation, you know, and to not just enjoy reading it, but to look to seek what the Father has for us, you know, in understanding what he's saying to us through this family, through their actions, you know, even through their non-actions as we, as we see, you know, on a regular basis as we read through. But we come out of chapter 45 and we see that Jacob finds out that his son Joseph is still alive. And all this time he thought he was dead, you know? And, you know, how would we feel? We looked at last week, how would we feel at that point when we recognize or realize rather that a person we thought was gone, no longer on this earth, someone we mourned for, you know, was now yet still here, you know, and that he's now the governor, he's now the grand vizier of Egypt what that must have been like for him, you know, so, so seeing through the eyes of Jacob on this journey now to go meet his son, um, as he goes back to, as he goes to Egypt. Um, so let's look at this. Um, let's go through, let's read the first seven verses and who would like to start off? Our reading, chapter 46, the first seven verses. All right. Okay. JP. Uh, Rick. Has, uh, oh, Rick, I'm sorry. My brother, you Rick. I, you got me on next. You know what I mean? My hand was up before yours was. <laughs> I thought I was slow to react. Look, everybody being humble. Look at that. To a message on pride and everybody humbling, humbling themselves. <laughs> Praise Yah. Go ahead, brother. First seven verses. All right. <laughs> and Yasharel took this journey with all that he had and came to bear sheep and offered sacrifices unto Elohim of his father Isaac. And the Elohim spoke unto Yasharel in a vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am El, the El of the, your father. Fear not and go down to Mitzrayim, for I will there make you a great nation. I will go down with you into Mitzrayim, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Yosef fell, uh, shall put his hand upon your eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Yisrael carried a left tab, Jacob their father, and the left tab their little ones, and the left tab their women, and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took a left tab their cattle, and the left tab their goods, which they have gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Mitzrayim, Jacob and all his seed with him his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his 
son's daughters and all his seed brought him uh, he with him into Mitzrayim. We see a lot of the uh, same Aleph Tavs as we point out, as we've been seeing strategically placed, very bringing significance to, you know, this family, their, 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 their inheritance, their, their, all of their wealth, all of their cattle, everything that's came with them, all of his seed that he's bringing into Mitzrayim, interestingly enough, you know. And, he's, and then he starts off with offering the sacrifices unto Yahuwah, you know, his Elohim. And that's where he was spoken to in that vision. And so we see all of these different things starting to play out again. Interesting how we're coming back into Mitzrayim again. This seems to be a, a big hub of getting food and all of the things that are necess necess necessities of life that Joseph is bringing with his father here, right? His family, all of the things that, that are his that he's bringing into Mitzrayim so that he can provide and take care of his family, yeah? So this is a, another aspect of that covenant being on display here that he showed this vision and it's, and it's unfolding, you know, and his family is seeing and recognizing. Can you imagine all of the emotions that these people this whole family has went through from thinking this this child is lost and you know not knowing where he's at to realizing that he's this powerful man that we got to bow down to to get some food and to care for us and and we found our brother again you know and so all of those i can only imagine the emotions that uh, that they were feeling especially his father you know yeah, he, yeah. He, I think he lost all but you know I'm excited to see this story continue to unfold. You know, I've loved this story my whole life, but I'm really gaining so much deeper understanding of really things I never even really looked at and paid attention before. So I'm thankful for these studies because it, it's really opening my comprehension and understanding of all these things that are connecting, you know, and what we're seeing portrayed here and pictures of like shadows, if you will, how the connections we're seeing with Mashiach, and it's it's beautiful. So beautiful study. Yeah, you got that right, man. I, I I definitely I definitely love you know what we're seeing, and I you know I, I'm gonna say this. I appreciate every last one of you, you know, that has part been partaking in these Genesis studies. You provide so much, you know. Um, I think as we look at scripture, you know, sometimes we come with a lot of preconceived notions or ideas, what we think, what we see, even what we read in commentaries that is off or incorrect. Mm -hmm. But you brothers and you sisters, you know, you really do your due diligence and study um, I think every last one of us has has brought something to the table that may have been incorrect and been corrected. Every last one of us has brought some correction, clarity to what scripture's actually saying versus what we thought it said. And, you know, I just wanted to let you all know that I appreciate every last one of you and what you bring to the table. Um, I think it's vital that everyone has a voice. I think it's vital that everyone brings a question. I think it's vital that the questions are answered. And the fact that we do it together and come to one mind is amazing, you know? Um, and we, we ought to be thankful for Yah for providing us with a group of people that loves each other enough to only depend on the Ruach as we search the scriptures. Um, because we all know there's much controversy through a lot of these topics that we're running through, and we're not skipping any of them. We're going from cover to cover. So everything that is provided for us for life, we're going to look at, we're going to see, we're going to get answers for, and what we can't, we're going to keep searching together through scripture. So, you know, praise y'all for all of you, and um, I'm enjoying uh, this story as well. Um, brother JP, bring it on, brother. <laughs> Uh, I was just looking at um, that portion right here in verse four. 
He says, I will go down with thee into Egypt. And just that, that it's like a covenant, you know, that he has with, with us as his children and as, as his people. He says, I'll be with you, you know. And uh, just to pull up a cross reference towards that, that I, it says in uh, Isaiah 43, starting in verse one and two, but now thus saith Yahuwah that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And it's so amazing. It's just like I, I see that with, with Jacob here, you know, coming out, being refreshed, knowing his son is, is alive. And now Yahuwah comes to him and tells him, don't, don't worry, like go down there. Like I'm going to be with you. And it just, it's just a confirmation for us that how he's with us wherever we go. Cause you know, we talk about spiritual Egypt, you know, and, and that sort of thing, you know what I mean? He's with us even in a spiritual Egypt, quote unquote, you know what I mean? So I just love it. I just love that. Uh, that he was comforted by Yahuwah in this moment, um, especially to, before going to Egypt. It's like, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the, uh, you know, the the physical. Like I wasn't there to to understand, but I can only understand that there was probably like a a little bit of fear for Jacob to go into that land, knowing like it's full of idolatry, it's foreign, and and so you know. To get that confirmation, it's just amazing. So, praise you. Yeah, and I think, you know, you know, part of that fear, too, to add to what you were saying, is the history and what Egypt had been to his people. Remember, Yahuwah had forbidden Abraham. He had forbidden his father Isaac from going into Egypt. Now, here he's telling them, go into Egypt. But I will be with you. You know what I mean? So that's a difference complete difference from going in himself and getting himself in a jam and then needing Yahuwah to come to his defense and get him out of it. He's saying, no, go in. So there's a preconceived idea and thought of what Egypt is to them as a people. So much so that Yahuwah had to say, I'm going to be with you. Don't worry about it. So um, that's, that's, that's a very, very good, um, insight for that for that particular verse um and it's it's it, it was interesting to me in 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 verse one where he goes to Beersheba. it's this is the place where he speaks to yah you know what i mean this is always but this is what the seventh time that because it's the same place that abraham went and the same place that isaac went to speak you know to to yah and he comes to him in a dream so Several hands. Um, I think Amy was first, then Linda, then Mecca. Hey, I think it's really profound what you've just said as well. Did you just say it's the seventh time, Brother Rod? Yeah. Okay, wow. I was just looking up the meaning of Beersheba. And uh, according to scripture, he, he, did he travel from Dan to Beersheba? Because Dan means judgment, and then Beersheba means, Bear means oath, and Sheba means seven. So the oath of seven, it means. That's where he went, to the oath of seven. Um, it's called the well of seven, a place in Negev. Absolutely. It, Bear is Hebrew Strong's H884, which means well of oath. Or it also states a place of swearing by seven lambs from Dan to Beersheba, from judgment to oath. And then Sheba is H7651, which is Shabai, which means obviously the root is, is, is comes where Shabbat comes from as well. Um, but it's, yeah, the seventh time you said right at the end then. And then it's just like, I, I thought what I was doing was stupid. But when you said that at the end, it's like, no, that's the whole meaning of the name of the place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when we were going through in earlier chapters, we looked at Beersheba and we saw that it meant the well of seven. So yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's, it's never stupid. I mean, I think sometimes we come up with insights or cross-references or even ideas 
that may seem foreign or different than what we're used to, it's never stupid because it's all according to scripture. And it could, it, even if we're seeing it wrong, it's something that we think we see, we're corrected. You know what I mean? So don't ever look at it as stupid. Yeah. No, it was really yeah. weird then when I was looking into it and right at the end, as I was just writing the last letter in the Hebrew letter, you said the seventh time and I was like, wow, bingo, there it is. Like that's why the word Ber Sheba, he said he keeps sending his people to places which have a name and a meaning to what he's actually doing with them. Absolutely. Great, great, meaning, great right? insight, wow. sis. Yeah. Sister Linda. Okay, um, I just wanted to just um, take note, uh, just make a little note to 46 and 2. I found this interesting. Uh, and Elohim spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Uh, because, uh, I, was, I found this surprising that he called him Jacob because in uh, chapter 32, he changed his name to, to uh, Yahshua, Israel. Well, they say Israel now, but we know it was Yahshua in the uh, original um, language. You think there was a reason why I called him Jacob, or do you? Um, well, um, you know, it's funny you say that because I was looking at that, and I and I remember early in Scripture he would use Jacob, you know, as a point of showing him his failing or his shortcoming. But he would use Israel when he was, you know, walking up rightly. Right, right, and I think I think to me, and this is not I haven't proven this in any way, so I'm not saying this is true. But to me, I think that his 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 life matches up now. Jacob matches up with Israel, so he calls it. And now, from this point on, he you'll see him use Jacob and Israel interchangeably. So I was looking at that. Right, it was, right. it was interesting the same way you saw it, but I think that we see now his life as Jacob matching Israel. So the names come together. So Yah uses that interchangeably from this point on, so. Praise Yah. Yeah. You see that? Yes. Absolutely. Brother Mecca. Yeah, I was just talking uh, he had brought out um, you know, Yah saying he will be with you in all, in all those certain, uh, you know, situations, you know, so that the, the, the sea, you know, will not overtake you, nor the rivers and, you know, the fire will not, you know, touch you or hurt you. And we, you know, we keep our eyes on Yah. You know, it's like, it reminded me, when he was saying that, it reminded me of when uh, Kepha was in the water and Yahushua was, was on, uh, you know, walking on the water and, he, he called Kepha out, you know, Kepha, well, Kepha asked if he could come out and, and Yahushua told him, yeah, you know, and when he started to worry about the sea, you know, and the, the waves and all that stuff, he took his eyes off of Yahushua and he began to sink, you know, and it's, you know, so important that we, we remember to keep our eyes on Yah, you know, and, and to really, to really know that you know, he, he's always with us. And I think people kind of have a, uh, you know, some people don't have a, a clear understanding of what that, what that's like. But when you think about it, like Yahushua was on the next level. Yahushua was always in the heads of people. Like Yahushua was, I mean, he wasn't communicating with them like through telekinesis or anything like that, you know, but he was always reading their minds and their thoughts, you know, that's how dialed in Yahushua is to us, even to this day. So when we communicate with him, it's not that we, you know, we got to take it to that, that understanding. Like he's like, I can communicate with him almost telepathically, you know, I'm not trying to sound like all mystical or any, you know, get like extra spiritual with, but at the end of the day, that's how Yah is. Yah, Yah, and he knows our minds, he knows our thoughts. We couldn't even know some prayers. A lot of people prayed within themselves. 
you know, uh, there was a situation with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Hannah, you know, uh, who who brought out. I think this one of the sisters brought out uh, Samuel, the book of Samuel, and and Hannah prayed within within herself, and the priest didn't know what she prayed, but he said, you know, whatever you seek God for, you know, let it be granted to you. And then she went, and then she had a baby, you know, and named him Samuel. So, you know, when we keep our minds focused on Yah, when we keep that, we know that he is with us. He's with us even in our minds, and we shouldn't worry. We should always have that faith and, and walk with him, knowing that, you know, walking this life, knowing that he was with us. He's, he's, he's connected to us. He's dialed into us, you know, and we don't have to, you know, we don't have to fear anything. And so, you know, just what JP was, was thinking about, I just began to think like, in all of the trials we go through, we have to remember that, like, he's with us. We can communicate with him and let him know even in our thoughts, like we're trusting in you. I trust in you. You know, this is your promise. This was your word. And I trust your word and your promise. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that just to what JP brought out. I thought that was, that was, you know, um, I thought that was a really nice connection. Yeah, I, I as well. I, but I wanted to look at something you just said. You know, you, you talked about how um, you likened the focus of, of, uh, of, uh Kefa, you know, when he took his focus off of Yahusha, he sank. When he looked at him, he stood on top of the water. Um, but before Yah says he's with him, look what happens prior to that. So he's not going to be with you if you're if you're not postured first towards him, right? He's not just with you. He's with those that are postured towards him. It says, so Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices. He offered sacrifices. He is consecrating his family before Yah, to Yah, before they go on this journey to Egypt. And that is what Yah is, 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 is honoring. You know, he's seeing that this man is dedicated to the the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and now him, right? So, so I just wanted to point that out that he that he honors those who dedicate themselves to him, who sacrifice themselves to him. So that goes along with your point. Um, so, I just wanted Praise to yeah. see that full picture of of that in that verse. So, um, JP, I just want to get uh, any thoughts on. Um verse 4 when it says and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes I just want to get some thoughts like what what yeah. I mean if there's something that you guys read yeah, about so that. so this that's specifically um speaking to uh uh the end of his life um it, it was customary for uh someone in your family to close the eyes of those who pass. So he's he's giving him your son, Joseph, who you thought you lost, will put his hands on your eyes. So this has to do with him passing. What else we see there? But what what must that have been like? You know what I mean? Like you know, Rick talked about the emotions. We talked about it in the introduction to today, just the emotional gymnastics that 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 Jacob, that Joseph, that the brothers that they were all going through, you know. You know, and and the dream had to flash before Jacob Jake, Jacob's eyes now. You know what I mean? When he's when he stepped aside and said, now nah, I'm gonna hold my peace because my son sees something. There's something happening in the stream that he's having, you know, the brothers now, you know, seeing, you know, the might of their brother as he's the, the grand vizier of Egypt. You know, not only not only is he the governor, he is the advisor and he's running everything. We're going to see as we read through, he has his hand on everything, the economics, the trade. All that Egypt becomes is because of the choices and decisions and the advisement 
that Joseph gives to Pharaoh. And uh, I don't want to submit that. Because all that Egypt becomes is because of Joseph, right? So, so we got to pay attention to that. Um, not that they weren't already, you know, large and in charge, but there was something specific to their growth that took place because of the provision that Yahuwah gave to Joseph. All right, so we're in, um, we left off in, have we seen anything else in those first seven verses? All right, so it's a lot of names here. So uh, if, if who can handle them? Because if not, I'll take it. <laughs> All things are possible through him, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> How many verses you want me to read, brother? Um, read, read up to stop at twenty-eight. Because <clears throat> it, okay. because it's a lot of verses, but let's get through all of the names. You know that right. way we can discuss it. Yeah. Okay. It says and start in verse eight. And these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. <clears throat> Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanak, and Palu, and Hezron, and Carmi. And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of, of a Canaan, Canaan Itish woman. And the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and the sons of Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. And the sons of Issachar, Tola, and Fuva, and Job, and Shimron. And the sons of Zebulun, Sered and Elon and Jalil, these be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Paddan Aram with his daughter Dina. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. And the sons of Gad, Ziphion and Haggai, Shuni and Esbon, Eri and Oradai and Areli, and the sons of Asher, Jimna and Ishua and Isud. And Bariah and Sarah, their sister, and the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel, these are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin, and unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim. Which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priests of On, bare unto him. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, Obela, and Becker, and Ashbel, Gora, and Naman, Ehi, and Rosh, Mupim, and Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born into Jacob. All the souls were fourteen. And the sons of Dan, Hushim, and the sons of Naphtali, Naphtali, Jazil, and Guni, and Jezer, and Shalem. These are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel his daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. And the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, and the souls were threescore and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. And he sent Judah before oh, him. Stop. Stop there. Okay, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Great. Hey, first of all, great job. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> these names could scare anybody off the screen. And I think you did a great job in, in, um, in, in, in saying them and reading them. And we can't, you know, we can't be afraid to to these, you know, in, in the past, 
most people skip over these. I am not reading all that, you know. Um, but great job, brother. Um, what do you see there, or you want to, or you just want to? We just want to look through. Yeah, I just I just look through them right now. All right, yeah, yeah. I, let's um, let's just. I have a, I didn't really I didn't really see like I mean, it was just like just you know a lot of lineage definitely um that I see definitely you know it's lineage like it's just. Yeah. That's about it. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's a historical um, document <laughs> of who the children of Israel were. Um, this, this is now chapter 49. We're going to dig, we're, chapter, we're going to take a long time to go through chapter 49 because we're really going to get into the tribes. I think that it's necessary. I think that we go through them and we look at it prophetically in every way that we possibly can, as well as what they are contemporary as we read in the word as Moshe wrote it. But here, um, we don't have to dissect it that way, but we do, we should look at this historical document of who the children of Israel were. You know, um, he, he names them in the order of, their, of the mothers and in the order in which they were born, you know. And it's, it's just amazing to me how the family moves, you know, not just by who they were, but the decisions that they make. You know, he mentions, you know, um, what is it, Judah's sons, you know, and what he then says, the sons, uh, you know, these sons were, they died, you know, so they're, they're, they're mentioning them as a historical event, but they're not actually with this caravan that's going to Egypt, you know, just so that they would be in record. You know, um, one of the things that, you know, people get mixed up on is where it says in verse 26, it says there were 66 people, you know. Um, so then they say, well, why does it say 70? And it's because you added Joseph, his two sons, and and Jacob. So now you have the four from the 66. So um, and then there's a passage in Acts where Stephen is running down and Stephen says there's 75. Well, that includes some of the wives that aren't mentioned here. So everything is recordable. There's no discrepancies in scripture. You know what I mean? Because people try to say, okay, well, nah, there's answers to that too. Praise you Um, so yeah, what do you see, Sister Olive, Sister Amy? Uh, sorry, I just thought it was interesting about the numbers, you know, specific numbering, like 33 in verse 15, there was 33 souls. And then obviously, as you just said, the 66, the free score and six, obviously there's the added on the 75, mm -hmm. which is in the renewed covenant. I just never think there's a coincidence in regards to the numbers. I mean, I don't know the 33, was Messiah 33 as well, apparently, or is that like a myth? I don't know whether he was 33 of his of his of his last time on earth i just don't know whether there's a connection there i think it's quite interesting but uh, i just want to say thanks to jp as well i thought it was quite funny when he's reading the names out <laughs> the bohu and tuhu and all these names it was really cool cheers thanks brothers well you know the um the line came through leah so it could be um but yeah, I think it's important that we we definitely document numbers. Um, he gives them for, for specific reasons. Um, but I also think too that you know what what Moshe is writing here by the guidance of the Ruach, you know, is for us to to witness the names that become the nation. You know. Because Israel goes from somebody's name to a nation. And we're going to see Israel mentioned as a nation for the first time within the next chapter, two couple chapters. So it's very important that we see the name Israel being the father, Jacob. He's now recording this as a nation by which become his people. So there's, there's, there's definitely that. So, um, but yeah. Definitely something we should look at the numbers for sure. Um, 
70, you know, um, I think 70 was a, was a token at that time for the ancient Israelites um, as a point of his, of, of Yah's blessings. Um, but I want to look more into that as well. But yeah, the names and the numbers are, are definitely there for a reason. Um, what else we see there? Amy has a hand up again. Oh, JP? Yeah, I think it was JP before me, brother. Oh, yeah, go ahead, JP. Uh, just to bring up, you know, um, just to bring up Joseph's wife, you know, I, I know, I don't know if we spoke about her before, but, you know, her being in, the, in Egyptian and, and it clearly, you know, they give you the description of who she is in verse 20, that um, her father, Potiphar, Potiphar, priest of On, bear unto him. And so just that it's interesting, you know, just that Joseph, because we were talking before about um, just the, the significance of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, or the tribe of Joseph in the end times, and and then the two sticks, and and Ephraim being one of them, and Judah being one of them, and just you know the just the lineage portion of of that, and just seeing how how Joseph, because he's in this land, he marries a, a woman in, from that land who's an Egyptian, thus makes her a pagan, I guess you would call it, you know, what I'm saying something that's against Yahuwah as far as lifestyle of everything and so it's just interesting you know what i mean i just find that interesting that and then they're and ephraim and manasseh are recognized as yahuwah's children yeah they're they're not like pushed to the side and said oh no nah, you you your parents one of them was an egyptian you're not full-blooded no nah, like you know what i mean so i just want to bring that up i thought that was interesting yeah after um After she met Joseph, she dropped all idols. <laughs> she said, I'm serving whoever you serving, brother. <laughs> Joseph was a bad man. So praise Yah. Yeah, nah. The whole house, you know, started serving Yah. Even Pharaoh, um, at this time, you know, you know, because we're gonna see later, you know, Pharaoh usually does the blessing. He was the God in the land. But but we find out later that Jacob came and Jacob grips him up and blesses him. So we're you know Jacob has has flipped upside down the minds and the thinking of the Egyptians, and they follow the guidance of Joseph, who was following the guidance of Yahuwah. So they're following the the the, the God, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Yosef. Praise Yah. So. Um, sister, Di oh, sister, uh, Amy, then sister Diane. Sorry, sorry, it's because I'm studying on a Hebrew site, so it just found it interesting as well. That, that for the name, I, I was going to say it'd be it'd be cool to look into each each of the names back into the into the original language to see what definition brings. I haven't. I had a look at Judah, which is quite interesting, just the one of them. And that shows obviously a, pi a picture of an arm, a nail, a door, and a man with his arms raised, which when you take it into the pictograph, it basically means arm joined to the door of breath or joined to the door released. That's just for Judah, though, which I find that quite interesting because we know Mas Mashiach is the arm of Yahuwah. Yeah, Yahuda. Described in scripture, yeah. and he was from the tribe of Judah. So yeah, it'd be cool to look at you know the names Ephraim and Manasseh as well at um at that, and even the name of Joseph's wife Asenath. It'd be good to look at what her name is in the Hebrew to get the definition of. She was obviously chosen by Yahuwah to be the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim. All right, well go go ahead. What 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 is what does her name mean? It's an oh, Egyptian I don't know name. At this I don't know at this time. I'll have to look into it. I'd, I could have a look. It might, yeah, it's, might, it's, it's an Egyptian name, but you, you can definitely see. Yeah, check that yeah, out. I'll have a look in the Hebrew and see what, what it is. Yeah, let us know. 
Thanks. Sister Diane. Yes, adding, adding to that uh, verse 20, um, I just wanted to say that uh, Yahuwah is sovereign. He does it the way he wants to do it. And I, I based that on, um, we were talking about, you know, Manasseh and Ephraim being of Egyptian blood, but yet and still they were looked upon, I guess you could say, as being pure Hebrew you know, maybe a way of putting that. But he is sovereign because we look at um, Esau. You know, if anybody has the pure blood, Esau would have, would have been more pure Hebrew than Manasseh and Ephraim. But Esau, he hated. You know, he rejected Esau. Of course, it was for his purpose. Um, just like um, he made no... Um, like he accepted these two um, Egyptian, part Egyptian, part Hebrew brothers, he accepted them for his purpose and for his plan. So um, I just wanted to, to, to bring that up, that he is um, sovereign. He does it the way he wants to do it. And this is also like um, an Aleph Tov uh, moment again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's interesting about what you're saying, though, is because it brings full circle, you know, Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11, you know, where Shaul is speaking to us and he's saying, it doesn't matter if you're in the bloodline. Right. You know, although Manasseh and, and Ephraim are in the bloodline, they're not full bloodline like Esau. Mm -hmm. So you can be in the bloodline and fall off the path and no longer be an Israelite. An Israelite is one who follows Yah, his laws, precepts, and commandments, period. You know, those who accept Yahushua as Mashiach, that is the bloodline. You know what I mean? So it, 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 you know, further, further draws, draws or drives, I should say, the wedge between those with the mindset that bloodline only, you know, and, and we got to be careful of that, you know, of spending too much time on that. It's great to find out who you are, but that doesn't drive your walk with your who. It's, it's a, your adherence to his word and your obedience to him, your acceptance of him. You know, are you a light? You know, you don't automatically get in, you know, you don't, because, because if not, Esau would be there, <laughs> you know, so praise God, that's a, that's a great, great point to make in the realm of what we're reading, because as we read the history of our people, as we read the history of the chosen of Yah. We need to pay attention to everything because Dan in certain places is not mentioned. You know, me, JP, and, and uh, Jadiel were looking at, the, at that not too long ago. He's right here. You know what I mean? So, and I think he'll be there at the end, you know, through the judgment. But I think, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of different ways we can look at the children of Israel and the fact that they often fell away from Yah and some will be cut off, whether you were bloodline or not. So praise Yah. Brother Kevin. Thank you. I think everything that you're, how this uh, conversation segued over into who is your, as you stated, bloodline and starting off in my belief as you said uh in yah in yahusha uh there's where my walk began then i got wrapped up into the bloodline and who am i and genealogy and dna and and all of that now 
for me myself, yeah, it started lining up pretty decent. I was feeling pretty good about myself. Yeah. Okay, I'm in there. I'm in there. But then, just as you're describing, it has that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with Yah. It has to do with Yahusha. There's the bloodline. I had to comment on that because I started here. I got wrapped up in all the dialogue and, 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 and talk and no, this is the way, this is the way. And now it's right back to where I started from. And that's just that original bloodline of, of the belief in Yah and following Yah and following Yahusha. I had to comment on that though. I'm sorry, I was muted. Absolutely, I'm glad you said that. Um, because, you know, unless we could park here for a minute because, um, you know, that was one of the binding factors in the beginning of my walk with Yah as well. Um, and I think, and we've all discussed this, that, you know, there is a hole specifically in the African-American community because as we look at who we are, you know, we always look to slavery, you know, we always look to, okay, well, what happened before slavery, you know, and to find out, you know, the, the cover-ups, to find out the name changes, to find out, you know, where Israel was residing, where they escaped to, transatlantic slave trade, where the concentration of the migration into slavery was. Those things are good for our knowing, you know, and I think, I think that once we allow that to be our identity only is where we lose it. Once we allow that to catapult us above and beyond and before everyone else is where we lose it. And I think that we have to understand that there was also a mixing of all cultures throughout. Great multitude came out of Egypt, even, you know, so in the in the mingling and the mixing all throughout history also plays a part in that. So there are Israelites, true bloodline Israelites of every culture. And to use that as a as a as a bragging point uh, to to demean, to uh lord over, to diminish anyone else other than the fact that those who follow him are his only is a big mistake. And I think that, you know, that, um, you know, coming to the true reality of that and understanding who we are means something. You know, we got a brother here in Mecca whose father is from the Igbo tribe, you know, so he's, he's connected strict, strictly to a group a group of people that migrated into West Africa that still have Hebrew traditions, you know, so that doesn't make you any better than anybody else, but it is good for our understanding and who we are because who we are has been covered up by history. Um, so the revelation that you got, what you see and where you are now is great for the hearing of the World Wide Web to understand the truth of, of this word, you know. Because Brother Rick is an Israelite. I don't care what y'all say. <laughs> you know what I mean? So praise y'all. Hey, I've been called white chocolate in the past. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Linda, go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. That was great, brother. I appreciate your testimony. And yes, as you as you brothers were uh, uh, speaking, it made me uh, think about um, uh, something that I think is very important. Well, from the beginning, any of these revelations that have come to me has only just given me more of a desire to uh, please y'all because we know uh, so many uh, Israelites have lost their lives because of disobedience. So just knowing that you're from that lineage or something like that really shouldn't uh, be something that people get caught up on because most of them don't, didn't even make it. But um, Something uh, Brother Jadiel uh, said in one of his, one of his uh, teachings a couple of weeks ago really jarred me to reality, and that was that it was Yehuda that killed the Messiah. Absolutely. So if it was Yehuda, the same people <laughs> we're, we're going around boasting to be a part of, 
that killed the Messiah, we should really be crawling on our knees begging for mercy. Thank you. That is nothing to play with. Absolutely. It's the quadri that everybody coming into the truth deals with in one aspect or another. Wow. And one aspect or another. I believe, well, let me find out who I am. You find out that, yeah, I'm bloodline, or you find out that, no, I'm over here, as was stated, Isu. He was hated, but he's bloodline. Mm -hmm. And I've always battled back and forth with those two things as well. How can he hate? They're both, uh, they're both bloodline. They're, 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 they're both from Jacob. Yeah, so we so we went through that extensively when we were um, dealing with uh, Esau and Jacob, you know, in those chapters. Um, and one of the things we looked at was um, that when when Esau was spoke of, he was all always spoke of in one that followed the flesh, one that ignored um, Yah, where Jacob was the opposite, you know. So we looked at what Yahuwah was attached to, and that was devotion to him, dedication to him, sacrifice to him, versus one who followed after the mind of the flesh and the heart of the flesh, followed his humanistic desires, that which he hates. That is the mindset. Those that follow in the way of Esau are hated. Those that follow in the way of Jacob are loved. Specifically, those two were opposite. So. Um, that's why, you know, oh, yeah. Yah hates and anyone is an enemy of Yah who does contrary to his word. So that still stands. He hates the way of Esau. He loves the way of Jacob. So hope that helps you a little bit. Sister Amy. Ooh, have I got some goodies. And um, just to say as well, Rick, I like white chocolate. <laughs> White chocolate's nice too. All different chocolate's nice. I'm just joking. So anyway. Uh, mm, I don't know. That, that might you don't like white chocolate, Brother Rod? Uh, no, I'm just saying we might have to have this discussion on another video about how oh, much yeah, about okay. white chocolate. Just, just joking, just joking. <laughs> oh yeah, in okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm catching you now. A bit came a bit late, but I, I, I've caught it. Right, right. Okay, so you asked me to look at the Hebrew word for asanat the wife of Joseph. I mean, you don't really get nothing much when you first go into the, it's the Hebrew strong six, two, one. Okay. And it means in, 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 before I go back to the pictograph, it means belonging to goddess Neith, whoever that is. Right. And, but actually when you take it back to the pictograph, it's quite interesting. So that's what I'm going to do. If, if pictograph if, of, his wife's name? Yes. Okay. So the pictograph is the Aleph, the Samak, the Nun, and the Tav. When you look at that, it actually re resembles a strong leader. The Samak res resembles a thorn or hate, but it also means protection or, you know, like thorn. If you go past a thorny bush, it's, it's like resembles a, a form of protection. And then it's a picture of a seed the noon and then the tab. So that together would actually say strong leader, I could say protects continual seed of life of the covenant. That's profound considering she's the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, I did a bit more research and looked at Manasseh and Ephraim to try and, because um, I found that interesting that it has the picture of a seed and a tab in the last bit of her name. So it, it, seed means continual life, and the mark, the cross, is the is the mark of the covenant, which is 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 kind of like a signature. Um, and then if you look at the word in Hebrew for Manasseh, um, you get Mem Nun Shin He, and it's Hebrew Strong's forty five one nine. It's a picture of water, seed. Sheen, fire, or separate, or consume, and the letter He for breath. Now, Ephraim is really cool. Ephraim means, sorry, Manasseh means causing to forget. Right. 
and Ephraim means double fruit. Now, this is the focus because this is powerful. Double fruit. Now, when you take his name back to the pictograph and the Hebrew, the Asian tongue, the word is Aparim. Aparim, inside that name, you have pe, Aleph, Pe, Resh, Yad, Mem. The Pe, Rash, and Yad is actually the word that we use for fruit of the Spirit. So fruit of the Spirit is Parai Ha Ruach, the fruit of the Spirit. And Ephraim's name has the word fruit inside of his name. And then it has the Aleph at one end and the Mem at the other end surrounding them three letters. So you have strength of the mouth of the firstborn arm on the waters or in the waters. I think that's really powerful to see his name. And obviously that means, yeah, I said double fruit. Reminds me of double portion as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for looking into that. And sorry to everybody, I wasn't being any way rude about the chocolate. I was just having a joke. Oh, um, no, no, you, you didn't even <laughs> have to read. You didn't have to revisit that. <laughs> no, just in case. I was... <laughs> no, nah, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, whew. Um, let's, uh, where did we leave off? We were in, we left off in verse 28. Um, so we see, we see the history of the people. Um, we see all of those that are in, you know, in the caravan or in the in the group that's that's leaving and headed to Egypt. Um, you talked about uh, the Canaan because not only are there Egyptian is there Egyptian blood, there's also Canaanite blood also because. Um, Simeon and Judah both married Canaanite women. So you have that mixture as well. Um, so again, we talked about um, Judah's two sons mentioned, Ur and Onan. Um, and we know that in, from chapter 38 that both of those die. They're mentioned here as a record of, of, of them being in the family, but they're not on this particular journey. And the other two sons, Perez, and Zerah, they were from Tamar, the daughter, daughter-in-law of um, Judah. So, um, let's uh, pick up in verse twenty-eight. I'll uh, I'll read. Verse twenty-eight says, um, "Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph." to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock. And they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you say your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So <clears throat> we see quite a few things here. 
Um, I'm going to open it up for uh, you to hear you guys' observation, and then I'll follow you before we move on. What do you guys see here? Anyone? All right. So uh, in verse um, was it verse two? I'm sorry, verse twenty nine. You know, <clears throat> I'm just picturing here the scene, you know. Of the of Joseph and his father seeing each other for the first time after all these years. But before that, one of the things that I saw in verse 28, it says, then Joseph sent Judah before him to Joseph. So here, it's very clear that Jacob is now treating Judah as the leader of all his brothers. You know, customarily Reuben was the firstborn, it would have been his duty to go before the brothers, but because of his sin with, with Bilhah, he was removed from that position, that honor. And it's now given to Judah. Um, as Judah has stand, stood up rightly, you know, before his brothers and before Yah, he now becomes a spokesperson for the brothers. He becomes a leader and the uh, heir uh, of his father. Um, but the scene itself, it says he fell on his neck and wept a good while. I mean, you know, you guys can picture that, you know, seeing a loved one uh, that you thought was dead, um, that you didn't know existed. Seeing your son who's now, you know, not only the governor, but like we said earlier, he is the chief advisor, the grand vizier to Pharaoh, you know. What did that look like? You know, what did they what flashed through their minds when they saw each other, you know? You know, the hurt and the joy at the same time, you know, and they wept while they held each other for that time. So those things stood out to me. Um, Sister Amy. My brother, that was from um, before, but I was just going to say I found it interesting in the last verse, in verse 34, where it says, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. I thought that was quite interesting, that uh, last verse. In verse 34, yeah. I thought that was really, um, I didn't know Egyptians hated shepherds. Or yeah, so. Abomination even. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for several reasons, um, one, they didn't like, uh, they they felt that the shepherds were unclean. They looked at shepherds at the bottom of the economical ladder. You know, wow. they were they were despised. You know, they were looked at as unclean, even specifically for because of their long hair. If you remember, Egyptians shaved all of their bodily hair because they believed it it it, it uh, signified cleanliness. Um, oh wow! They had a they had a revulsion or a distaste. Um, towards shepherds, and you know, I, I think I think there are a couple reasons why um, Yah had that as a as a divider. I think he wanted to also purify the line too, because if they felt that way, they wouldn't co-mingle, they wouldn't pro cohabitate. So it would kind of, you know, although the there was some Canaanite blood and there was you know some Egyptian blood, it didn't pollute they weren't polluted with the ways of the Egyptians by intermingling with, so they were kept apart. Some of the, you know, um, you know, I, I told you guys before that I went, my first date with my wife, you know, 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, well, 25 years ago, was, you know, we went to the Archaeological Museum at um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Ivy League School in Philadelphia. And, you know, although I didn't see all of the artifacts because I was looking at her most of the time, I did see some. And one of the ones uh, that I remember is, you know, artifacts of Egyptian culture. Um, and the, 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 you know, some of the pictures in the books, when the Egyptians spoke of shepherds, they often drew pictures of one eye or they had shepherds with one leg or they were, you know, despised. They didn't, they didn't, um, you know, see them some sometimes as people, they called them dogs. So they did not co-mingle or cohabitate. So they were respected by Pharaoh simply because they were the family of Joseph. So see how even Yah's provision over his people, even in that situation. So um, that's specifically why Joseph carved out that land and asked Pharaoh to give them that portion of the land. So, but also that land of Goshen um, would have been uh, surrounded by water as well. So it would help with their livestock and the way that they lived their lives. So um, that's that's what that verse is referring to. Um, I, 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 I also think it's interesting that it says about the, the shepherd being an abomination because later on throughout scripture, we see that King Dude, David was a shepherd. Mashiach was a shepherd. <laughs> So it's not just here. We see it's kind of interesting. Um, it, it kind of makes me wonder what what kind of mindset the Pharisees or the people who killed Mashiach as the, as the shepherds. He says that the, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep shall scatter. It kind of, you know, the father used the people's own heart were able to be used by him to, to do his you know the bidden of the killing of Mashiach. It's kind yeah, but of... they were they were they were abomination in the sight of the Egyptians. They weren't an abomination in the sight of Yahuwah. So I no, mean, yeah, they... yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, the Pharisees didn't like the shepherd either, did they? This is what I'm trying to identify, like the traits of mentality. Even though you could say you were, they could say that they were like Yahudim or whatever their heart and their mind said otherwise because they hate they hated the chosen shepherd as well i'm just seeing if there's a connection that's all hmm. i'm just wondering because it says you know that there was an abomination to them and i'm thinking well because messiah speaks to the pharisees and says you were sent as shepherds to you they were sent to shepherd the people and to be of the vineyard but instead they made their own vineyards and killed the shepherds that were sent on to the people and now the son's been sent from the kingdom and you're gonna kill him as well. So I just, I'm just kind of seeing the if there's a if the if they had kind of their hearts was lifted up as the Egyptians, because the Egyptians were quite proud people. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it could quite possibly be, um, but you know, this is in direct reference that that which you, what we read as far as abomination is a direct reference of what was customarily customarily the the thought process of the Egyptians. Um, mm -hmm. Genesis forty three thirty two says, so they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for it was an abomination to all the Egyptians. So this was wow. something in their culture. This, 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 uh, you know, I mean, I guess down the line, we could try to draw that conclusion, but I think. I think it's very important, too, that we don't <clears throat> miss, you know, because we do know that Joseph had parallels to Mashiach. Um, but what we don't want to miss is what is happening here specifically, because that's the first meaning. That's the first understanding. What we see here, what is going on here, and how we can relate that to what's happening to the Israelites. I think ultimately it has a bigger picture as we look to seek it. But at this moment, it's referring to the way the Egyptians feel about um, the Hebrews. So um, definitely want to keep that in mind. But yeah, there, there could be a connection with um, the way that Yahusha is received, you know, 
by the people, by his own, <laughs> by G Yahudin, you know, by Yehuda. Um, Sister Diane and then Brother Kevin. I, I think Brother Kevin was before me. Okay. Thank uh, you. You could, you could go ahead because mine is a different, it, it segues off of what's been said, but to keep in line with the conversation, please, Diane. Okay. Mine is a segue of sorts too, brother. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, in terms of the favoritism and the blessings that Israel has received and that Joseph is receiving from the Pharaoh one being that um, he was given the land of Goshen. And if we look at that um, geographically and agriculturally, Goshen was a, a very large and a very rich um, in soil land. Um, it was very, it was very fertile. Um, so I thought that uh, this was an, an excellent case of uh, them receiving Yahuwah's blessing. I don't think Joseph asked for Goshen. I believe that it was actually given to him um, by Pharaoh. Um, I think Pharaoh just told him that you all can dwell in the land of Goshen. So um, may have to go back and check that out for sure. Uh, 45 and 10. Um, well, in nine, um, where it said, Haste ye and go up to my father and said to him, Thus saith the son Joseph, uh, Yahuwah hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and you shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me. I, I don't, it, it doesn't really say if uh, who made the decision for them to receive that land, but. Uh, Goshen was a very fertile land. The other point I wanted to make was in terms of uh, the abomination, not only their hair um, being an abomination, as Brother Rob was saying, for the Egyptians, um, that was nasty per se because it was very unclean, um, according to them. Also, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, the Egyptians idolized cattle. Um, cattle was um, a god for them. If you go back and look at some of the um, archaeological history, you can see there was a uh, kafir. Kafir um, was the name of a cattle god. So uh, to eat the flesh of cattle was also an abomination. Um, Cathor, I think, was the name of the um, cattle god. So it was also an abomination for them. So to know that, to know that the Israelites ate oxen, which is which are cows, you know, and sheep, um, it was repulsive. So I just wanted to bring that out um, as well. Well, I mean, the, the Egyptians had cattle too. That's that's matter of fact. He asked Joseph later on. He says, "If you have men, take care of my cattle as well, because you mm -hmm. basically because you'll do a better job." So I don't know that they didn't eat um, livestock, but okay. uh, they definitely despised the shepherd. They definitely despised um, the Hebrews as a people for sure. Perhaps that that God uh, Cathor was kind of like you know, um, and it it was an idol in terms of them worshiping the cattle for prosperity of their cattle, which of course it goes against all of Yahuwah's um, teachings. But you know they had many gods, so maybe that's what that was all about. The the cattle was worshipped so that they would uh, prosper um, and be fruitful, which we know is an abomination. Right. Thank you. 
Yep. Um, thank you, sis. Um, I was just looking at something else. Uh, Sister Linda. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I guess I wanted to very briefly uh, tap on uh, 46 and 30. Uh, and Israel said unto uh, Yosef, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. You, you know, our progenitors, you know, uh, Elohim being with them, believed in going to their grave in uh, peace. And uh, we, the first time Shalom is mentioned in uh, the Bible, as we learned in our class the other night, is in 15 and 15, Genesis 15 and 15, where it states, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. This was part of their uh, inheritance. And Joseph, not knowing where his son was, what had happened to his son, anguishing and grieving over his son all those years, how he was able to find peace with himself, even though we know he lived uh, quite a few years after that. But at this particular point, now he felt that he could go to uh, his grave in peace because he uh, now seen that his son was okay. Praise y'all. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's definitely, um, you see it mimicked, you know, even now in our culture, you know. I, I remember, you know, being with a close friend of mine, uh, <clears throat> who died, he was 50, I think he was 53 or 54. This is about 10 years ago. And uh, he found out he had cancer, but he didn't, he didn't know until late. So he kind of died within a year. It was just a swift process. Um, <clears throat> but I remember, you know, one of the last days I saw him, and I think I was there, his, his son was there, and uh, a couple other people were there. But he was sitting with his son, and he was talking to him. <clears throat> and when his son finished talking to him, his son, you know, walked over to me. His son gave me a hug. And then I, I went over, and I was talking to him. And I said, how you feel, brother? You know, and I was, I was literally speaking of how he felt physically, you know, where he was, where his mind was. And he, he just said, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready. And it just looked like the conversation he had with his son was one of satisfaction. Like not only was he pleased with his son, but he also kind of gave his son last instruction, said the final things he needed to say to him. And he said he was ready. And I just remember, you know, when I left, I was like, you know, I told him, I said, well, I'll see, you, I'll see you tomorrow, you know. And, you know, I wasn't even connecting the idea of him being ready and him sitting with the son, but he didn't make it through the night. So I didn't re realize until that next day that he seen all that he needed to see, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, he was a believer as well. So. It was uh, it was something that I thought about when I when I read that particular verse. Um, so, Sister Linda, I think you're on point with their eyes meeting. You know, some some something that brought such pain in him not being there. Something that brought anguish, even you know, the delight, and that his whole life, <clears throat> as he looked at his son, you know the joy that he brought him prior to him being ripped away and now seeing him where he was, he felt at that moment, even though he lived 17 more years after this point, he felt at that moment, I've, everything that I need to see in life, I've seen, I've seen your face, I'm ready to go. So um, it's definitely something we could take from that um, because, you know, we're human, you know, we, we're connected to people. You know, we watch family mem members pass and, you know, I remember the last words of my father, you know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't know he was going to pass away when I left to go away, 
And when I came back, he had passed. But I hold on to those last words, you know, like I gripped to them because that's all I have left. And I think what we're seeing here is a human response to life and to how we connect with other people. So I don't think we should miss that. So I appreciate you pulling that out, sister. Um, sister Amy. I, no, I just uh, was looking at, I just thought it was interesting to look at the word Goshen. Um, the meaning in Hebrew means drawing near. And um, that's Hebrew Strongs 1657. It's the Gamal, the Sheen, and the Nun. Um, I thought that's interesting. It means to draw near or drawing near. Yeah. But what, so what took place there? Did he meet? Again with Yahuwah, or did something take place? Did he draw well, near to Yahuwah there? Did he draw that's near? The land, that's the land where they resided. That's where where they took all their cattle. So they didn't go into. They were in the countryside of Egypt. They had a specific place carved out for them, and it was a place with you know, like uh, Sister Diane brought out, rich in soil. Um, the Nile River was there, <clears throat> if you remember. The Nile is where Moshe's mother put him, you know, yeah, to yeah. go into Egypt. So, if, so if, did, if it was a it was an area that was rich um, and close to Egypt. So, could but did Joseph did Joseph uh, uh, draw nearer to the father there as well? I don't, I don't, I don't see. That. Does it mention anything? That's what I was asking. If he drew near, I think it's interesting to. Because obviously his that his father, his earthly father dies, and obviously he draws near to him and sees him in the face, face to face, which is quite interesting. Um, because he says, I had seen thy face because thou art yet alive. And I think that's, I'm wondering whether there's a connection because Goshen means to draw near. Um, and he obviously, that was where he seen his, his father, his, his earthly father. Mm. I can honestly say I didn't see that, but uh, you know, we have meanings of words for a reason, and we will continue to look at that, Sister Amy. Appreciate it, <laughs> Brother Kevin, and then Sister Diane. I will. Uh, my question originally was about. Uh, the shaving of the head and shaving in general. That was my question. But your uh, memory of your father and the last words, and it relates to uh, hanging on his neck and crying for a long time and, and remembering, hey, hey, I, I, I'm good now. I'm good. Okay, I got to see you. Everything's good. And you went back through, I, I remember the last things my mom said. I remember the last things my father said. And just like yourself, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Come back next day, he, he's already gone. Right. I remember seeing my brother, ironically, just a year ago, uh, six months before he passed, he's in the hospital and I'm hugging him on his neck because even though he's in the same city, I don't, we don't hook up like that. So it'd be months before I see him. So that was uh, seeing him in the hospital and hugging him up. That's the way I felt. And two months, three months, four months later, okay, he's okay. It was just a little blip. And then another month later, he was gone. So I can relate to that. Uh, back to my question about shaving and how uh, the Egyptians, they, they shaved everything. And now that I think back to it, I say, yeah, they're always naked like that. They don't have anything. Right. No beard, no mustache, no. 
How does that relate to an Israelite? Shaving, cutting your hair and lining it up. Okay, I understand all that. And I practice that. But shaving, you know, uh, razor to the skin, taking it all off. Can you, can you uh, touch base with that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> I think there's something to say about specifically the Egyptian culture when it came to the way they shaved their hair, um, because they did still have facial hair. You know, they had um, beards that were rounded. Uh, if you remember the on their chin, they had the long post of hair, and it was rounded. And, and, and Torah tells us not to round our beards in that same way. So when it comes to, you know, our direction by Yahuwah in Torah of what not to do with our hair, it's, re, it's relating to those that worshiped other gods in the way that they had their hair. So it's very important to keep that in mind, not to say that you can't shave your head off, your hair or your beard, um, but it's okay to grow too. You know what I mean? There's a specific way in which he's speaking of when he talks about shaving in the realm of what their culture that surrounded them. Remember, they were coming out of Egypt. And he was telling them what not to do. And a lot of what he was telling them what not to do was relating to those things in the, in the area in which they grew up in. They grew up in Egypt. They saw these things. He didn't want them doing that. So um, specifically with the Egyptians, they shaved their hair off um, versus the shepherds who grew their hair. <laughs> you know, so um, right. that, that's what that um, is well, referring to. You could, you could look at my background picture and you can see I'm shaved around and I used to have the lawn straight down from the chin. I used to have that. That's where everybody knew me as. Okay. Years back, I, that's all I had was that long Egyptian beard. One dude said, yeah, like the beaten at Cat Daddy. I was like, okay, I, 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 I can go with that. I, you going back with that one, Cat Daddy. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to know that because of my own uh, hygiene issue where it's like after a while, hey, I got to shave all this off because the, the skin underneath is you know, it's holding dirt or yeah. I'm not cleaning well enough. So, hey, I got to take it all off and then start again. So I asked that. And you gave me a good answer, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's definitely, you know, it's a necessary to read scripture in its full context because if we don't and we just look at certain verses, then we wind up doing something that y'all didn't tell us to do. Or exactly. not doing something that y'all told us to do, you know, so, um, and we're, you know, one of the exciting things about coming to the end of Genesis, we get ready to go on Exodus, you know, so we're going to go through the laws, statutes, and commandments, and we're going to go through, and JP knows we're going to dissect these things, you know, we're not going to leave any stone unturned, there's going to be no questions asked, and those questions that we still have, you know, we'll find together, so. Um, yeah, hold on, brothers and sisters. We 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 we're about to really dig deep now. As we near the end of uh of of the beginning. This is the the end of the beginning of the story, right? So, um, Sister Diane. Yeah, and just to keep this one short. Um, back to Goshen. I too, um, like. Sister Amy wondered about, you know, why Goshen is mentioned. Uh, it could easily have read, uh, they received the fertile land, I don't know, east of Egypt or, you know, uh, southwest of wherever, but it actually mentions the name, which would make one look at that in terms of why Goshen, uh, she, uh, why they're calling that name. It also mentions uh, like drawing near, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the, um, the paleo of drawing near. Uh, we know that uh, Joseph was a great administrator you know, the, the guy was good at what he did. Uh, he was a diplomat. He was a businessman. He had favor of the people. 
So um, this could be sort of related to that paleo of drawing near because he had the favoritism of um, Pharaoh. You know, he, he, he was close to Pharaoh. They basically had drawn um, near to um, one another. And, and, and there's also that favoritism, like in drawing near to Yahuwah. You know, Yahuwah gives us um, the best, you know, of everything. He said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So um, in a sense, um, um, this is a drawing near, you know. And, but, you know, along with the favoritism of Yahuwah, it's also because of the person. Uh, Yosef himself was, you know, because he had drawn near to Pharaoh. Pharaoh they had become close, you know, uh, to one another. So I just wanted to say that's the thought that came to my mind. Um, because, like, why is Goshen, why, why is it important to mention the word Goshen when so many times we read? east of this or west of this or on the other side of that or whatever this name is actually called out so there is significance to that you know more so than just a place well i mean i i i think you know there may be something to the name drawing there but it, i mean it's mentioned i think specifically because it, it's the place where they were dwelling because it you know it doesn't really say um, I mean, it does. I, I, I do. I do know exactly what you mean as far as, you know, some places in Scripture where it says east of Goshen or east of Egypt or you know. Um, but this specific land, see, because one of the things I said earlier, I think what you questioned was Joseph asking for Goshen. So. I thought we were going to make it into chapter 47. I was going to bring that back to you, but we're not going to make it into 47 this week. We don't have enough time. So, but we'll see in chapter 47, Joseph is asking for Goshen through his father and his brothers. Okay. So, so he tells them what to say mm -hmm. and then they go ask. Awesome. And then yeah. Pharaoh comes back and he says, send them the Goshen, which he wanted yeah. to in the first place. But I think there's significance to the fact that he wanted them near, but yet not within, because there was still there was still some separation from what was going on in Egypt. Um, I think part yeah. of it was to keep the bloodline. I'm not saying Joseph wanted the bloodline pure. I think Yahuwah did. But mm -hmm. I also think that there was something to say about Joseph knowing what the Egyptians were like. And knowing his brothers, and knowing that, that, that they might fall into some of those ways too, um, and be t com completely taken away from Elohim that they knew. So well, I'm glad you said that because I thought that um, someone had actually asked for the land, or the land was actually given to them. So that comes up in chapter 47. So right. yeah. uh, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, oh yeah, no problem, sis. No problem. Um, thank you. Uh, Sister Linda. Yes, uh, I just wanted to, I was, while you were talking about Goshen, I just did the, uh, the mononic meaning of it from the uh, meanings of the letters very quickly. Um, Goshen, it's the, the uh, Gimel, it's the uh, Shin, and it's the Noon. And if you interpret those letters, it could be journey to press for the continu continuity or continuance of the seed or the hmm. air. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, 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 in that meaning, it, it, it lends to what I just said, keeping the bloodline pure. Yes. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, praise God. Thank you. So, uh, Sister Diane, Sister Amy, we have the reason they're in Goshen. Ha <laughs> ha! To keep the bloodline pure. Praise God. Praise his name. <laughs> No, I, I, I that answers, that, go ahead, that go ahead. answers the drawing near too, you know, yeah, yeah, keeping yeah. it pure. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, and it's, um, see what I mean? This is what I'm talking about. This is learning Yah's word together, you know, um, here, 
you two sisters were saying, Amy thought she saw something. Diane thought that something was to what Amy said. I said what I thought it was. And then Sister Linda, you know, does the letters and it brings both of our understandings to one meaning. You see that? So the Ruach moves through when we allow him to, to, to let us not keep our mouth shut, but at the same time, be respectful to our brothers and sisters' ideas and see what scripture only says. And that's what we do here. So praise you for that. And that's what I mean. This is how we do it. And we'll continue to. What would you do without us? All right. Without him. Without him. Praise you. See how I did that? See how I did that? Um, but uh, <laughs> um, man, this chapter is, is really something. You know, um, we looked at, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of, of why they are where they are, you know, and just the provision that Joseph was making. One of the things I liked what Sister Diane just said was how she ran down the attributes of Joseph and all of the things he was known for and all of the things he was proficient in because it helps, you know, the understanding of the direction that Egypt goes through, through his provision, through his mind, you know. Brother JP. Uh, just, I, I know, I don't, I, I'm sure you guys talked about the shepherds and things, but um, it was interesting, you know, as I was reading it, um, just to mention, you know, he says in verse 32, and the men are shepherds, you know, for their trade and he but he talks about like all his brothers like his people you know and then i was thinking about there's a verse here is isaiah uh, 42 verse 6 um this is out of the uh nlt i was trying to find i was trying to get to the uh, the regular version but it says i uh, i yahoo have called you to demonstrate my righteousness i will take you by the hand and guard you i'll give you to my people israel as a symbol of my covenant and them and you will be a light to guide the nations. Um, Cause I always think about who Israel is, like the people, you know what I'm saying? And from the beginning, they were always gonna be the light to the world, like the light to the nations, light to the Gentiles, light to the heathen, whatever word you wanna interplace. Cause all these words, they all come back to the same Hebrew word. It's interesting when uh, father, uh, well it says Abraham, the father of, many nations are the father of i think it says like the the father of the nations or something like that but his his name comes it can re it can still be translated in the english to all these different you know gentiles and, and things like that so you're kind of like there's a confusion sometimes with that of course in today's you know debates and stuff but but just to see that the people Israel, when you're Israel, you become a light to the people. You become a light, you're a shepherd. You know, that's what you are now. And so uh, just seeing that all the whole 12 tribes, that's what they were, you know what I mean, that were coming in. And I just find that amazing, you know, to speak about um, his children, Yahuwah's children and who they are once, especially when we talk about grafting in and all that. But so I'll leave it at that, Shalom. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well said, brother. Well said. Sister Linda. And, and, and Brother Rick, very quickly, just to, uh, I, I don't want to be redundant, but I just want to clarify that just to take it to the next level to really bring it home, because I was rushing, but when I look back at it, listen to this journey to eat for the con continuity or uh, continuance of the air. Yeah. And that's what they went there to do, to eat. To eat. Yes. That shin, that shin means eat or press. Either way you can take it, but to eat is even more specific for what they went to Goshen for. To you know, because one of the things that's interesting, and, and we're going to see it next week when we go to 47, is that, you know, the, the all of the Egyptians, so, so the way, um, I really like what Sister Diane said because it, it goes into what we were going to touch on in 47, in that, Joseph's provision, the way he set things up, remembering the dream, 
knowing what he needed to do to sustain the whole world at this point through this famine that they were going into. And what's interesting is that we're going to see the Egyptians selling everything they had. They're selling their gold and their silver. You know, when they ran out of gold and silver, they started selling their, their, their livestock. When they ran out of their livestock, they started selling their land and all of the things to, to make Egypt even bigger. And then to watch how the, those that were in Goshen never had to sell anything because Joseph made provision for them. So um, praise you So, all right, I think that pretty much uh, concludes this study. Um, so we're gonna close this out. This concludes our Genesis chapter 46 study. Genesis 47 next week. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Akuti, and Brohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own, to study Abba's word, and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website, at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the Giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to Biblical Assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much Avaha and again Shalom.